Um, aloha, everybody, uh, for the second Dan and Friends this week. Um, it just uh, it should be a relatively brief one. I'm just going to focus on the, what's going on with COVID. And the reason I wanted to touch base with you is just to uh, share the plan. And I did get a good deal of questions. Um, uh, I'll answer uh, some of them. And others will probably answer in a more general way or maybe will answer in my update. Um, so first of all, thank you for all you've been doing this week. Uh, it has been a crazy week. We have uh, been gradually increasing in our COVID numbers. I think a lot of you follow it, but today we have 39 patients in the house and we have 100, I think, and 42 patients in total. So we're about the busiest we've been uh, ever. Uh, we're manag managing that. And um, I think as a whole, it's gone quite smoothly thanks to your hard work. And I think good management on a lot of dedicated, uh, by a lot of dedicated people. So um, uh, take a little slight bow while you're busting your behinds, but anyhow. Um, so what's going on? What's the latest? What's our plan? I think that's the main uh, point of our conversation today. So um, as we are speaking, or actually they probably are close to finish, we've moved down um, 16 of our uh, our waitlisted patients, most of you uh, know what that term means to our ECD uh, North uh, facility. Uh, we have been using that uh, as administrative space over the last week as we kind of have been staying one step ahead. We emptied that out and got it ready and actually had to accelerate uh, that timeline a bit. And so the patients that were in our short stay uh, recovery area have been moved down along with uh, several other patients. And so we should by this afternoon have um, 16 of those individuals cared for um, in ECD North. So a lot of work has gone into place to uh, make sure that they are cared for properly and that our emergency response processes are in place. Uh, it's not less care. It's just in a little farther away place. So certainly they'll have all the uh, services that they had uh, when they were in the main hospital. I actually did the walk through myself uh, at a brisk walk from the morgue down to ECD North. It's uh, about two minutes, 45 seconds. So um, not too far there. A lot of folks have uh, really done a great work to get that space ready, IT, housekeeping. Um, we've had, uh, I know I'll lead people out, uh, central supply, uh, certainly nurses, uh, pharmacy, you guys all really got that place ready to go in the short order. And that's been really helpful because we want to roll into the weekend with a space to put patients. Uh, we only have a couple of beds right now to work with, um, and by moving those individuals down, that will leave us uh, at minimum the 12 uh, spaces we had in short stay. Uh, we don't want to use all of those, ideally, because we've seen our cases go up a few every day. Uh, this will give us time to do some surgeries next week, uh, hopefully for at least Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We can get some of the backlog potentially uh, work through. And I know those of you who are involved in those types of services have been contacted or are contacting our docs and others. We want to take advantage of that window. This is, of course, assuming that we don't get pounded too hard this weekend. Um, we'll have to see what occurs. Uh, I noticed today I got the latest numbers and the statewide hospitalization count, and they actually went down by two, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but considering they've been stepping up day after day, this is uh, good news. We hope that holds for the weekend, but weekends can be pretty challenging uh, as you guys are all aware. Um, so how are we staffing that area? We've been, um, well, I know a lot of work has gone on around that. We've thrown a, quite a bit of incentive behind this. Uh, mahalo pay and police work night shift overtime pay. Uh, a number of different differentials to um, not only thank you, but to encourage those to help us um, to do our staffing until we can get this next wave of our uh, FEMA nurses in place, which should be, uh, hopefully they'll be at the bedside in different units by Wednesday of next week. So we've been working to cover Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And um, we do have uh, rosters built and we have had people step up, um, but 
again, uh, that's, uh, uh, well, there's a lot of appreciation and only possible because many of you are working past your FTEs and more, and uh, it is uh, greatly appreciated. So what comes after that, if things continue to work up, um, we actually can go a little larger than 16 beds in short stay, um, excuse me, in ECD North. Um, it's not ideal, but we can probably go up to as much as 24 in that space. Makes it a little crowded, but um, it is possible and to do it safely. Um, we also are planning and teeing up the potential to open the other side of ECD, which is ECD South. It has a lot of now doubled up in, uh, finance and accounting folks. Uh, if we have to, we'll relocate uh, that service, but that definitely has an impact on us and our ability to operate. So we hope it won't come to that, but uh, we're always trying to plan one step ahead. That gives us quite a bit of capacity in space, but again, we will have limits on our staffing too, even with the FEMA nurses that are coming. So uh, once we start to get into those areas, it does become harder and harder to sustain the effort. Uh, but there is a plan to go through that. That would get us um, well beyond uh, you know, anything that we've had before. I uh, probably would put us in the neighborhood of around 60 um, COVID positive patients. So uh, hopefully it won't come to that, but I think everyone wants to know that we have a plan in case things, uh, in case that does happen. Um, so that's the plan. And uh, for things even beyond that, you know, we're discussing with the county and with other EMF, excuse me, other emergency services. And um, bluntly, that would be mostly uh, their responsibility to cover if we got outside of our facility. But we want to do everything we can. We only have the resources to do so much. Um, let's see. It was done. Right, so uh, my, I have a good question for Michael, you know, what can we do to help? And actually I had several questions about this um, kind of related to staffing. And I know people are definitely willing to pitch in. Like today we had uh, uh, nurses and staff from a number of our support areas helping to move the 16 patients down. Uh, we have uh, nurses and staff pitching in to help in process these uh, FEMA folks. And, um, uh, you know, it's a silo. Everybody jumps in and helps. A question was asked uh, before we had uh, um, a lot of, uh, well, I think about UR, a case management staff. We had some other folks that working, that worked outside of the bedside for a long time. We did a training program. You know, this has kind of come along relatively quickly and it's uh, come along in a different, it's not in a mass effect. It's been in a very steady one. And probably the biggest difference is that we have uh, with our FEMA nurses, about 27 additional nurses. So for all of those reasons, uh, you know, uh, it likely, uh, we likely won't press into service those individuals unless we get into the ECD South side. And once if we're over there, uh, we likely will be pretty much anybody that has some clinical background will need to uh, step up. But right now, our plan for our staffing through ECD North does not impact those individuals. Um, and But we do appreciate their willingness, and a lot of them also are helping to do some of the things that our clinical nurses are doing that they don't have time to do. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything else related to that matter. I think I cover that particular one. Uh, oh, and the other thing, uh, I know that our nursing uh, folks have been trying to put together, uh, we just had a conversation about that this morning, um, a very clear needs list, like what shift do you need here or there? Because we do have some nurses that have worked at the bedside recently, in like in the last year, year and a half, and they want to help out and they're actually expressed very willing, but we need to know where exactly they're needed and how best to deploy them. Uh, so uh, that is being worked on. And I think some of those individuals actually are helping out through this period between now and when the next FEMA group uh, shows up. All right, so I'm gonna uh, get to uh, questions. So I don't know why am I putting a mask on. It's just a habit. Let's see. 
So I had several questions about this uh, regarding testing in the emergency room. Uh, why don't we set up a testing center? So before when we had a testing center, I don't know if you were if some of you may remember it, but it is actually pretty staff intensive and takes uh, a quite a bit of effort. And, um, and also it was located where we're building for, so for a number of reasons, uh, we don't plan to get into the testing arena. Uh, the other reason we're not planning to get into it is that there is a number of different areas, uh, places in the community that are offering testing. And it's not something new. When we first did it before, really no one knew kind of how to test it. It was like, how would we do it? Drive ups were just starting. Uh, now, uh, you know, urgent care is the county, uh, I think uh, Premier Medical Group. I mean, there's a whole gamut of folks that are offering testing. And so we've decided to stay out of that. Now, um, the other question is, well, then why are we doing it in um, the emergency room? Well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, in our ED, we, uh, we want people to come if they're concerned, if they feel like they're sick. Okay. And so sometimes people don't really know for sure if they are honestly sick or not. And um, they, if they go to an urgent care, sometimes they'll tell them, well, if you think you're sick, you shouldn't get tested. So they're in this gray zone. So we want them when they come to the ER, if they ask for some, ask for testing, we, we're not gonna say no, but we will ask guiding questions. You know, how do you feel? Are you symptomatic? Um, uh, a physician or a caregiver will make that assessment. So it really isn't an option for us to not offer testing in the emergency room. Uh, people ask, could you set up a separate testing site? And we've had some discussion the last couple of days how to expedite that process. But at least for now, we're going to continue uh, to offer uh, testing. But we're also trying to get some messaging out there, too, that if you're asymptomatic, you know, the ED is not the best place to do that. Um, let's see. We have another question here. This is um, uh, from one of our rehab or uh, rehab areas, but basically it says uh, there's a lot of concern about the increase in COVID patients, but as healthcare providers and HMC, HMC being the only a hospital on the east side of the Big Island, should we be keeping up with the healthcare needs of the rest of the community, including being able to provide outpatient rehab services? covering occupational, physical, and speech therapies to everyone in the community and not just the select providers. And um, I'm not sure if some of the uh, rehab providers in the community have cut back recently here due to the surge in COVID. Uh, but in general for rehab, our stance, especially for outpatient services, is that's not something where we feel like we're a sole provider. There's a number of rehab companies in the private sector in the community, and uh, except for speech, and um, they do uh, a lot of these services. And so we don't feel like we have to be the, I guess, the big dog on the street with that. We want to do it for our population or our, our providers here within the HMC family, but not necessarily to the whole community. And uh, I know some folks might not agree with that stance, but that, that is our approach right now. Uh, another question I got, I understand test kits and limited test sites are, and limited test sites are limited and time consuming but can staff have an option to be tested at our lab using their own insurance uh, and um, with no copay or discounted copay? So the short answer is, well, no, we really can't do that. So our arrangement with clinical labs is to provide um, serve a set of services. They actually have a contract. Uh, they cover our inpatient and some of our outpatient areas. We really aren't set up for what you would call retail where, you know, uh, one of our employees can just walk in and um, get a test. We, we have that process set up through employee health, but not where you can uh, just go into like the drawing, the outpatient drawing center here on the first floor. So uh, this question here uh, is also related a bit to what we discussed further. And I think I'll just kind of condense it a bit is that uh, are we going to pull the nurses back that used to work in the ICU to help with ICU patients. And I know some of them have been helping. I know Brian's been out there and I know Megan's, uh, she was in ICU, but she's been helping with the ED. And we have had 
Um, some of that is those individuals are available, but we haven't had a mass you, thou shall all come back and go work in this area. So we've been going off of volunteer for now, and that has seemed to have worked pretty well. Uh, the other thing is um, we do, we are getting quite a number of FEMA nurses, and I do think that 17 that are arriving, I think will help quite a bit. I believe we have four or five ICU nurses in that contingent, and I think that will help quite a bit. So let's just try to get through the next few days here. Let's see, if an employee received their first COVID vaccination this week, will they have to do the mandatory testing weekly until their second vaccine has been scheduled? You got to wait three weeks for your second shot. Um, I don't want to answer that incorrectly. I think that would be worth a call to HR. That's kind of unique, but whoever you are, um, thanks for getting that first shot. And uh, um, uh, we'll try to work with you on that, but that's a really good question. And I got a number of uh, several questions of regarding on how you do testing if you're not vaccinated and rather than uh, go through all of them. So uh, HR, I talked to Don, our HR director, and by Monday, you'll get a uh, all the ins and outs of how to uh, protocol, I guess, to follow for testing. Uh, when is when's it due? Uh, how many days do you can do you test uh, when you're on vacation? All of those uh, issues that we're going to try our best to collect people's questions and then put out one protocol that will tell you how to go about and comply with the testing requirement if you don't get vaccinated. I had two questions on this. Um, why doesn't because uh, if you're not vaccinated, you have to wear additional PPE. And um, the question basically is, well, why doesn't everybody have to wear additional PPE? Because if you're vaccinated and you still can get the Delta variant and potentially pass it on to others, shouldn't you, um, I guess, shouldn't, shouldn't everybody be held to the same standard? And I can see why people would ask that question. Well, part of the protection we require our staff to wear if you're not vaccinated is actually to protect you. So if you're not vaccinated, you're missing that layer of protection, you know, that force shield that uh, uh, Chad talked about. And so your um, additional face shield and protection and so forth does help you because sometimes you're in settings where you're around more than one or two people. Uh, so I would just say the simplest thing is just say, think that you're taking better care of yourself. Um, another question we had was, uh, can we do mass testing? And I think the, uh, let's make sure I read the question correctly. Well, I hope I state the question uh, correctly because I, uh, I think I misplaced that one too. But the thing was, the, the premise was we have all so many staff getting infected. Shouldn't we do uh, mass testing again? And so I, I got the latest numbers. In August, we've had 13 uh, employees test positive and we have about 1,400 employees. So that's a little under 1%. So uh, it, I don't think it would bring us a whole lot of value to, to test all 1,400, especially because that's a moment in time. I think we need to keep in place with our, with our PPE, our protections, and so forth. Um, another uh, thing you know, to that point uh, applies to really a couple areas. There was a question about, well, shouldn't we stop visitation? Uh, because of exposure protocols and so forth. And then the other th question was, uh, um, should we allow people who come up to the hospital that may be COVID positive to um, enter our emergency room and not have a special area to go through? And I think it's good to keep this in context a bit that um, we've been dealing with COVID and COVID positive patients in our hospital at various levels. It is more right now you know, for months and months. And I think our protocols are good. We don't get our staff infected in any large extent. And most of those positive infections have not been from exposures at work. They've been exposures at home and out in, you know, people's lives in the community. 
you're probably the most protected because of our requirements and the high percentage of vaccinated people in this workplace and you are out in Target or anywhere else. So I would encourage you all to think about our place is actually a relatively safe place to be and to not get infected and to also not pass it on. Um, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but if you think about um, we haven't had outbreaks here. We're not transmitting it to patients, and it doesn't look like we're transmitting it to each other. So when a visitors come here um, to see their patients, unfortunately not their family members that are here for COVID, but for regular patients, remember it's controlled, it's for a time period, they are required to be vaccinated, and it's dang important if you can to be able to visit your loved ones. And we already have a big chunk of our population can't have any visitors. So because of that whole, all those pieces, I really think we should continue with the limited visitation for, uh, you know, for our staff, excuse me, for our inpatients in a very controlled way. So um, we'll continue to look at that, but you know, I think it was a very good question and I thought it was certainly worth an answer. There was um, a number of questions on COVID pay, okay? Um, should we, how do we pay, um, should we pay everyone? Uh, there was also a question on our FEMA nurses. Well, they're making these ridiculous amounts of money. Shouldn't we pay everyone, our own staff like that? So uh, a couple of, let's just start with the FEMA nurses. So I know something about how the contract and traveler nurses work. Um, the companies take a big chunk of what the hourly rate that we pay. So I'll give you an, an example. So for our FEMA nurses, uh, they, um, they had to recruit them to all come on very short notice fly them here, uh, put them up in housing, bus them here back and forth. Uh, so I would say probably two thirds of the hourly rate is taken by the company. And sometimes the employee uh, also, um, you know, for other, there are other expenses that are charged to them. So they, they're not making, um, bringing home, you know, 200 bucks an hour, okay? So you hear all these numbers thrown around like that. Now, you could certainly talk to them, but that's my understanding. The other thing uh, I think to consider is, you know, the degree of flexibility that's required for you as a, say a traveler nurse that works, I don't know, in Pittsburgh and you get this call, you kind of have to drop everything, fly out to a COVID hotspot and pretty much all you do is work. Uh, you work, you come, you go. Well, you probably should get a pretty substantial premium in pay for doing that. And really right now with the market, almost any nurse can go do that. It's just not feasible for you know us as a hospital to uh, pay those same type of rates. For one, we don't have the money and I don't believe any hospitals doing that. Um, so I think actually I'm pretty thankful that we have the resources and to be able to bring in this help in the first place. And we do have to pay for a piece of it, uh, but uh, we certainly are grateful that, you know, we're getting the assistance from governmental sources as well. So bluntly, no, we can't pay the same as our, um, our emergency help. We have added a number of incentives and bonuses to, I don't know if bonuses is the right word, we actually use differentials, but they're kind of bonuses. Uh, for those of you uh, who are working COVID, we still have our Mahalo, Mahalo pay. Um, we also have, if you work in our extended care facility, pretty much the, the equivalent down there because you are away from well, really a lot of your, you're out of your comfort zone for sure. And for this short period of time, uh, we really need night shift uh, nurses and those and aides and those of you who are working over your FTE. Uh, we have a pretty substantial differential there. So we are trying to, I guess, uh, spend the money and uh, encourage you and thank you for your effort. So just trying to find that sweet spot between, you know, being fiscally responsible, but also uh, making sure you guys are getting compensated for your effort, efforts. I think that pretty much covers almost all the questions I did. No, actually, I have a couple, a couple more. I'm sorry, I got it. Uh, I should do. This one made me chuckle a little bit, but I figured I would do it. And I'll read it exactly as it says. It says, do you need to have a Filipino background to advance with this company? So the short answer is no. You don't. Our Filipino nurses and caregivers are awesome. And yes, they are. Uh, and they do advance in our company because they're good. 
But to advance in this company, you need to be the best qualified, and you also need to have the best attitude. And um, and you know what? I believe cream rises to the top. You do that. I don't care who or where you are. You can uh, grow um, at Hilo Medical Center. But I, I, I just felt like I had to answer that one. Um, there was another question here about um, that we're, well, you know, we're requiring people to be vaccinated, and it said, I'll just read it, vaccinated or not vaccinated, we all need to work together as a team to beat COVID and stop causing division and stress for employees because of their vaccination status. Vaccinated or not vaccinated, we are all subject to getting and spreading COVID. Unvaccinated staff are fearing for their livelihood. And so I get that. And I think that was a heartfelt statement that was put out there. But, you know, I'll just put this is I probably should say mostly my opinion, but I think a lot of people share it. Um, I was reading an article and it said that for those of you who are Catholic and I'm not Catholic, but I still was impressed. The Pope uh, came out and encouraged uh, all his all his I guess flock or fellow Catholics to get vaccinated because he described it as an act of love and I thought that was like well wow that's that's pretty impressive to call that because he says when you do you're not taking just taking care of yourself you're caring for others and see and I think that's the essence of this um, you know the way a virus works is indiscriminate and so if one person doesn't protect. It's not like they're just keeping that um, to themselves. It impacts everyone around them. It's, it's a shared issue. So, you know, when you get vaccinated, you're taking care of yourself and your loved ones, but you're certainly are protecting the community around you. And, you know, it was a, a really good way to look at it. And, and the other thing, I know a lot of people, including myself, I hate being told what to do. And I certainly hate being told what to do if there's not a good reason for it. But I think in this circumstance, you know, your choice perhaps to not be vaccinated is not a neutral choice because if you get sick and we see it all through the hospital, you don't expect to come to the hospital, to not come to the hospital and be treated. You have consequences for that choice. You're really ill and we see it all through our facility. And I believe every one of us who gets sick expects to be cared for. You know, some of our COVID patients have been in the hospital for 50, 40, 50, 60 days. That is an enormous expenditure of healthcare resources. Now, I'm not saying that they may or may not exactly in that case, you know, be because they were vaccinated or not, but odds are they would have done a lot better had they been vaccinated. So I think we're fooling ourselves if we say that our choice has no consequences to others. So if we really want to beat this together, and as this question said, you know, all uh, join hands and beat COVID, well, let's all get vaccinated. Okay, so now, sorry for the preaching, and that's my opinion, but I figured it was a fair question. So uh, I'll just put it out there, all right? So that went through the questions and also um, kind of my pitch to please get out there and get your shot. And then we'll go to some of the questions in the chat box. Uh, why are we allowing unvaccinated visitors and caregivers into the outpatient clinics within the hospital? That was asked last week. It's a good question. So uh, we just happen to have our clinics within our hospital setting. You know, they could just as easily be, they are across the street or somewhere else, but those are still patients vaccinated or not that need health care. So when they come, we can't tell them you can't get care in our clinics, just like we have vaccinated and unvaccinated patients come to our emergency room, or for that matter, come to the ER and become patients. So I think if you look at it that way, there's no way to tell that we shouldn't be telling our outpatients, don't come to the main hospital unless you're vaccinated. Their caregivers, in many cases, are essential to them getting here, whether it's to drive, to help them navigate and get in. So we really can't bar them either because then we would in effect be barring the patient. So that's why we don't apply that vaccinated requirement to those outpatient visitors. Uh, mainly, mainly the hospitals offer bonus incentive pay for overtime and staffing crisis such as ours. So we certainly pay overtime um, for 
Actually, we pay overtime for a lot of things. If your schedule gets changed, you get overtime. I mean, I know the bargaining contracts, we're very generous with our overtime. And then in addition to that, and kind of maybe what you're talking about here, we have uh, we are we have offered a differential for our night shift coverage. That's in addition to whether you uh, qualify for overtime or not. So we're doing uh, some form of that for this five day period when we absolutely need um, this additional assistance in staff. So um, it's a good good question, and um, and we're doing a form of it. How do you staff the regular floors that are short when you only offer a differential for ECD? One aid on a shift is not safe. Um, uh, I think what we tried to do for ECD is uh, take into consideration uh, that even though you're caring for the, a non-COVID population, that you're able to get at least some incentive for working really outside of your comfort zone, okay? So if we followed, I guess, the original requirements um, without doing any type of adjustment, you would get float pay if you're an aide and worked in ECD, but that would be it. And since the whole move in the assignment is related to COVID, we thought, you know, a mahalo pay would be, which I think is three or four bucks an hour, but I'm, I'm, my memory, I might not get that right. Um, that's why we offer that. Okay, so as far as working on the floor, um, you know, if you work, certainly work over your FTE, you get uh, certainly your overtime. And if you go to the COVID unit, you get your, um, you get your co you get float pay and you also get your Mahalo differential. So we do have a mechanism to pay your, pay you more, but not when you're doing your regular shift on your regular floor that you're regularly scheduled floor. Uh, we don't pay extra for that. Let's see. Let's see. Our out our out outpatient urgent care centers are seeing a lot of COVID positive patients without extra help. No incentives here is the possibility of incentives. I don't know if I understand that correctly, but if it's asking um, I don't, I'm sorry, maybe we could uh, kind of rephrase that question. I'm not sure if you're asking if there should be incentives paid at urgent cares. Um, but anyhow, uh, please, uh, you can try to rewrite that if you can. I don't see any other questions up there. Uh, we will do continue to do more frequent uh, Dan and Friends just to keep you guys updated and ask for your questions and so forth. Probably do one uh, early in next week if um, um, if things continue, you know, in this uh, kind of this crisis mode. So once again, I have a couple more here. Why is why is the current outbreak at HAH that stems from a vaccinated employee uh, get ignored? It, it's actually uh, not ignored. Uh, they did get uh, uh, they did have someone they think uh, may have brought that into the building, and when we traced it back, it uh, most likely was someone who was uh, had, who was vaccinated and got the. Um, COVID at a family gathering, and I believe it went through about 12 uh, individuals at uh, HAH. Um, no, everyone remained mildly symptomatic to asymptomatic. They were almost all, um, a number of them were vaccinated, and again, as the vaccine has been purported to do, it keeps you from getting really sick. We also did some um, a proactive treatment with like monoclonal antibodies and stuff for anyone who had some symptoms. And so one of the great things about it is really nobody got sick, nobody got admitted, nobody died. So if that's the takeaway from Holly Hola Hamakua, um, that's a good thing. So good question. All right. Um, I think that's it. You guys, thank you again. Enjoy your burgers and big chickens today and aloha.